prostitution, human trafficking, the sex trade. These crimes impact communities, devastate families, and trap victims in cycles of addiction and abuse. Buyers are the fuel that feeds all sex trafficking and prostitution, and Columbus police are pushing for stronger penalties to reduce demand. How important is a plan to reduce demand, and how do reasonable penalties against the buyers of sex impact the issue of human trafficking? Who is a typical John, and could someone you know be buying sex in Columbus? These issues recently led to a meaningful discussion suggesting legislative action and a more comprehensive approach to the problem. Listen in as advocacy groups and Columbus police collaborate to make meaningful change. We'd like to uh, welcome everyone who's watching this. We are the Columbus Division of Police. Uh, my name is Ken Lawson. I'm the Victim Services Liaison for our PACT unit, which works out of our Community Response Bureau. And we are responsible um, in part for investigation of uh, prostitution in the city of Columbus. And we wanted to have a panel discussion to educate you about some of the things that we're working on and who some of our uh, partners are in the community and see if we can uh, provide an educational opportunity for what's going on in our community currently and some of the things we'd like to do uh, in the future to work on this. Uh, we're currently working on a demand reduction uh, plan um, it has several working parts to it. Uh, we're hoping to uh, introduce an amendment at City Hall that would amend how we handle buyers uh, of, of uh, sex or prostitution in the city of Columbus. It would have some, uh, some additional penalties than what, from what we have right now, some fines. And we're also working on some programming pieces to be able to reduce demand in the city of Columbus that we hope to talk about more in the future. Uh, but I'm joined today by uh, Deputy Chief Knight, she's over the Community Services Subdivision. She is uh, overseeing the PACT operations and development and the construction of our unit. Uh, we have Hannah Esterbrook, who is the Executive Director of Sanctuary Knight. It's a nonprofit working to open a full-time drop-in center on Sullivan Avenue on the west side of Columbus. We're joined by Chris Stoller, who's a human trafficking advocate here in Columbus. And he has been working for several years with John School as an instructor and also working with some of the men who've expressed an interest in follow-up and a, an additional relationship following that. We have Michelle Hannon, who is also uh, very active in the community. She is working with the Salvation Army uh, with their anti-trafficking programming. And uh, they, are, they have been very active in the Columbus community for, uh, by my guess, about 13 years now, Michelle. Okay. And we're also joined by Gwen England, who is the coordinator of Cats Court, one of the programs that's been very successful and we're proud of um, and has gained national attention through our Franklin County Municipal Courts. So thank you to all of you for joining us. And uh, Chief Knight, if I could start with you, um, what's the traditional approach to prostitution by law enforcement in Columbus? Well, Ken, um, the traditional approach uh, to prostitution related offenses in Columbus is and enforcement of visible violations. This is kind of the basic model that police have always worked off of. It's we enforce visible violations, street level and less visible encounters that are on online platforms. And we attack it through both supply and demand, but it's an enforcement based approach. And it, it includes arrest and citation and those arrested are back out in committing the same offenses in literally a, a matter of hours in a lot of cases because these are misdemeanor offenses. Um, there's little return on the investment for that traditional model for the Columbus Division of Police and probably a lot of our other law enforcement um, partners because it actually fails to address or interrupt any cycle of prostitution related offenses. So what we have ended up having is officers go out, they enforce these, these laws they make arrests or they issue citations and then people go to court and we go out and do the exact same thing the next day. So there's a, a level of real frustration by law enforcement officers that they're really not solving any kind of problem. Um, and there's been many cases where uh, the offenders are back out on the street before we finished our actual paperwork for the arrest. And, and so there's a frustration in the law enforcement community about this approach and there has been. It also does very little to rescue victims from this cycle. It doesn't deal with root causes. It doesn't address those things. Law enforcement has, you know, dealt with this through a law enforcement perspective and not really 
had the opportunity or the resources to look at root causes. And the community is equally frustrated with us as well because, you know, they see us make arrests and then they see the same individuals back out committing the same offenses again immediately. And so no, but I think everybody has acknowledged that that model hasn't really worked, but we have continued to do it for a long period of time. The Columbus Division of Police in the last you know, year and a half has, has looked at this under a, a new model. We've had to change some of the things that we were looking at because we know this isn't working. Um, prostitution itself is a symptom of, of human trafficking, addiction, homelessness, lack of family support, uh, you know, juvenile runaways and, and things like that. So it's actually a symptom of other things in most cases. And these are problems that law enforcement is actually ill-equipped to deal with and resolve on their own. So when we were looking at what can we do differently, we realized we don't, we don't have beds for addiction and we don't have housing for homelessness and we don't have those things. And so we need to partner with people that do. And, and so law enforcement has to reach out and develop partnerships because we, we can't solve this problem. And so we're responding to an, a, a symptom that really has no impact on the solution. So the PACT model is, is basically developed out of necessity. I would think it's a, a resource-based approach where law enforcement is actually seen as the first opportunity for engagement and a connection to services through our partnerships. And um, so we also looked at this as women are, are treated at, as victims from the very first contact um, instead of just offenders. And so that has been a shift in actually how we view um, offenders in this uh, uh, pool of individuals. And the, the arrest process has changed. It's meant to separate um, uh, you know, victims, that's still an offense, but it's meant to separate them from the street, from their traffickers, provide an opportunity for detox, and more importantly, an opportunity to push them towards catch court services, which are, are services on a specialized docket, which I know Gwen will talk about. And, um, and it's also to engage these individuals in every step of the process with counseling and service opportunities. So we are starting to push them towards something that will actually break the cycle, that will actually create rescued victims, that will actually create outcomes that include people not returning to the street. So I think that under our model, um, it, it is actually something that we can actually have that impact that we have wanted to have for so many years and have not had the ability to do that. So I, I think that's the difference between the traditional model and what we're doing right now. I think we've seen some return on that investment, but I will tell you that this couldn't even be considered without the partners you know, on this particular group here and all of our other partners outside of law enforcement because we cannot solve that problem without them. We are grateful for those community partners and we're uh, seeking to, to work more regularly with them. Uh, Gwen, could I ask you, when women are arrested, how does the court seek uh, to interact with them? Uh, what are we trying to accomplish there? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, so I think the, the goal for interaction has a lot of different layers to it because there's a lot of different needs and levels of this. Um, in which um, the women are at different stages in the life of prostitution. And so their needs are different depending on where they're at. Um, our hope is to engage every woman um, who is a victim that comes through those courthouse doors on some level. Um, relationship is kind of like the special sauce of catch court. And so um, the connection uh, immediately and early is very important to us. So we've worked with um, the PACT unit and the Human Trafficking Task Force, as well as the Public Defender's Office and the prosecution um, to, to get the names of those people um, when they come through arraignment, um, to try to make contact initially. Um, and then we also have a jail program where we offer a group inside the jail one time a week. Um, and we try to engage them in some early recovery services and programming and just begin to build that rapport. Um, and then of course, hopefully they come into catch court, right? Like, 
they, they sign up and, and say they want help and they want to exit the life and they want to be sober. Um, and we can offer them, you know, a world of resources if that's the avenue that they choose. Um, another element that the Corps provides is our um, three-day educational program, which is called Catch 101. Um, and again, this is depending on, um, you know, what stage they're at in the life and how many prior arrests they've had and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a specific group of women that would be eligible um, and meet the criteria for Catch 101. But that is, again, just to make connection, build rapport, let them know that we're here. Um, so they, they can learn about Catch Court and they can learn a little bit more about just the cycle of human trafficking, prostitution, and addiction. Um, we're trying to erase the stigma. This is, this is kind of our heart in, in the court. Um, you know, traditionally they have had very negative experiences um, when they're coming through these doors um, with court personnel, with law enforcement, with even attorneys. Um, and we want to try to change that narrative um, for them um, so that they feel um, valued um, and they can begin to have a little bit more hope that they can do something different. So that's, that's kind of the summary of the different things that we try to do with the court process in the beginning. So it sounds like basically you're just trying to let them know that you care about them and that you want Absolutely. to be there for them. Absolutely. So uh, if I can throw out just to the group, uh, what's the biggest misconception uh, that people have about prostitution? I can, I can throw something in there. There's a, a lot of misconceptions, but um, the things that you know, when I'm talking to the community, the things that I hear first and foremost is their per people's perception if you don't live in a neighborhood where prostitutes are walking in front of your house, which is a lot of neighborhoods in Columbus don't experience that, that very visible form of prostitution. They see prostitution as sort of like pretty woman, that there's something glamorous about it, that this is and that this is a choice people make and they're just entrepreneurs. I, I can't tell you how many times people have asked, well, it, aren't, isn't this just a choice they're making? This is a job, you know, that, you know, this is the only job that requires this extensive psychosocial rehabilitation, but uh, this is not um, a, a clear picture of what this lifestyle is like. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I see. Now, individuals that, have prostitutes, um, if you live in like the Sullivan Avenue corridor or in certain areas of the city on the south side and, and um, the, the near east side, where you see this on your street, you recognize that, you know, this is not something akin to pretty woman. Um, it, you, you see these people, you know um, how tragic their stories must be to be in this position. But I would say generally, the general public thinks that, oh, you know, it's just a choice in a, you know, a job or a profession that, that someone would aspire to, which is absolutely incorrect. So some people are just picking up their image from uh, journalism that they see on television or from Hollywood. Um, whereas um, we have kids in our school system, when someone asks them, how many of you have seen a prostitute on the street? Almost every child in that school raises their hands in those assemblies. Um, so for some, they only see it uh, on a big screen or on their television and others are actually living where they visibly see it. Uh, anyone else, uh, misconceptions that we have? I'll jump in, Ken. Okay. I think one, one of the things I hear is the phrase, like she's just out here feeding her habit. Um, and I think that that's a very like, low-hanging fruit or lazy perspective of prostitution, specifically outdoor prostitution or street-based prostitution, I think there is um, undoubtedly an overlap with substance use disorder and the, the lifestyle of prostitution. But I, I think to use language like that, like she's just out here feeding her habit, just really, um, you know, it amplifies this sort of element of choice or addiction and it minimizes the role that systemic injustice has played in the life of this individual that has led them to early exposure to drugs and alcohol, you know, incredible amounts of trauma uh, and, uh, and understandably a dependence on a substance. So um, yeah, I think that's another common
So it, it, it fails to take into account all of the drivers that could put someone out there in that situation. You don't have to take That's right. Anyone else? Yes, I think just to um, really to underscore uh, what Stephanie Sheets and I shared and what Hannah shared, the idea that it is, um, it is a victimless crime, that it's, it's really no harm on any side, and why are, we, why are we wasting so many resources on trying to intervene with something that truly isn't harmful for the participants? You know, I, I feel like that is a perspective um, that, that we heard. It tends to just perpetuate this idea that, that there is no um, that there really is no harm and it, it, you know, this idea of it being a choice and it's just not the reality that, that, you know, that we see or that survivors share from their life experiences, beginning with uh, oftentimes really persistent systemic trauma from an early, early age, all the way through the point where maybe we first meet, you know, whether that's on street outreach or if that's in um, one of the uh, the law enforcement operations, but um, but the point where that intervention happens is, is sometimes decades past the start of this trauma for someone. So the picture you're painting for us is drastically different from that pretty woman um, big screen portrayal. Um, and there's two sides to this. There's the person who's out there on, uh, if we call it in economic terms, the supply side. Um, but there's also a demand side. So there's a buyer in this equation. Uh, Deputy Chief Knight, what happens when a buyer is arrested or when a buyer is encountered on, in a police operation? So when, um, so the Columbus Division of Police, when we do enforcement activity, we actually uh, enforce both sides of the equation, uh, supply and demand. So um, those buyers are the less visible side of what we're seeing out there. They're driving around these neighborhoods. Uh, we find a lot of times they don't live in those neighborhoods. They come from other neighborhoods into that neighborhood because they're aware that there is street level prostitution there. Um, they'll drive in that neighborhood. Um, and those individuals are just like anybody else driving down the street in a lot of cases. So it's not as visible but it's driving this entire problem in, in most cases. So what we see is um, there's really not, and, and Chris can probably talk better about this, but um, there's not exactly a, a, a normal picture of who this buyer would be. It, it ranges, we see people that we pick up for this offense and we see individuals that come from all walks of life, from all, uh, backgrounds. Uh, some are, are very wealthy, some are very poor. Um, some of them are, um, some of them don't speak English. They come from a variety of places and circumstances. So there's no actual picture of what a buyer looks like in Columbus, from my experience. Um, and, and so for us, when the men are arrested, um, we arrest is the preferred course of action with them. And why that is, is that's a decision we have made as uh, the division of police, because we believe that um, writing somebody a citation that is typically much less than a traffic ticket for this type of an offense that is preying on vulnerable people in our neighborhoods, we believe that that's absolutely inappropriate. So. It is an arrestable offense in Columbus. You will go to jail, um, but you know, and, and Chris can talk more about what happens when they potentially go to court, but we're building a model that'll be begin also exposing some of those underlying causes for that behavior. Because just like what we see with the women or the prostitutes that we, we engage, there's underlying conditions that are driving demand in, in a lot of cases. Um, we have repeat offenders. We know that they'll go back out there and commit the same type of actions again. So we want to know what those root causes are so that when they go to court and they're in front of a judge, we can ensure that there's something in place to provide sentencing alternatives that will actually address what is pushing demand. Okay. And following their encounter with law enforcement, with us, uh, they wind up going to court. And uh, historically, we have been sentencing them to something called John School. And Chris is one of our instructors there. He's been working with it for several years. 
And Chris, can you tell us about John School? Sure, yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, you mentioned it earlier about <clears throat> supply and demand, right? It's easy to think of trafficking as a social justice issue, but it's first and foremost a business and it thrives on the law of supply and demand. So there's a lot of different ways to address the demand side, to reduce the demand for trafficking, if you will. Um, but one of the most popular ways across the country is what's called the John School. And for those that might not be as familiar, it's basically an educational program for men who've been arrested men or women who have been arrested for uh, for soliciting. And it's typically individuals where it's their first time offense, uh, no history of violence, and they get anywhere from, you know, a, a one day educational session up to uh, multiple week or multiple month sessions where uh, we bring in individuals from, uh, from local anti-trafficking organizations, we bring in uh, licensed counselors, we bring in therapists, uh, actual survivors of trafficking to help these men understand uh, what what led them to this point, right? This is our one chance to engage with them and help them really think deeply about how did you get here, right? How did you, what what led you to, uh, to, to make that decision to solicit and prey on someone that, you know, is dealing with a lot of complex issues. Um, so I've been teaching as, as a board member of She Has a Name here in Columbus. I've been teaching there for several years now. And uh, it's, it's been fascinating, you know, uh, you mentioned that, um, uh, Deputy Knight, that there's no, in, you know, consistent profile of what these primarily men look like or are, and, and that's true. I've taught uh, men that are 18 year olds. I've taught men that are 78 year olds. Uh, they represent all the different, uh, you know, racial, socioeconomic backgrounds. And what's crucial with these classes is to really connect with each one of them and help them think through why they chose to solicit. And, uh, we've been able to sort through hundreds of pages of questionnaires that, that these men have filled out. And one of the questions we ask is, why did you solicit? And some of the most common reasons include um, things that you wouldn't think of, right? You know, we, we tend to think of solicitors as motivated by, you know, addiction, but the reasons that they've told us is um, deeper issues like loneliness and depression, uh, those are excuses, right? Not excuses for their crimes, but it helps you understand some deeper issues that are going on so that we can help them, right? We can help them address those root issues and not go back to soliciting again. So from your perspective, there are some people coming to John School that we could come alongside and assist and maybe uh, prevent them from doing this again if we can help them. Absolutely, yes. In a typical John School class, um, it's six hours long. Um, we have presenters. Is it an interactive session? Do the men talk about what's going on? Is there communication? What's what's a typical atmosphere like? Yeah, the atmosphere really varies. It just depends on the group. You know, sometimes you have uh, dozens of men. Sometimes you just have a, a handful, depending on how many have been arrested and worked out with the attorneys. So it really depends, but we try and facilitate conversation, um, you know, through the public John school with um, here in Columbus, you know, it's all the teachers there really, it's not supposed to be a lecture, right? We're not here to, um, to you know, to, to blame them, to point fingers, we're encourage them, we're there to help them think deeply about their reasons. And so we try to have as much conversation as we can. There's always some men that, you know, you can tell that just are, are kind of tuned out, checked out, and I don't know if we'll ever be able to to, to help them, but there's always at least one person in that room who you can tell is really thinking deeply, is asking good questions, is having conversation, and those are the few men that, that we know that we can help. And I've been to John's school. Uh, the one thing that impressed me the most in the atmosphere were the people who were presenting. Uh, they have huge hearts. They're trying to help. They're trying to form those bonds and those relationships and see how many people they can get uh, help to. Um, Gwen, Hannah, both of you have had relationships um, with victims. Do you have a success story that you could tell us about uh, that might help us understand more about what it's like to be in this and come out of it and, and your perspective on that process? I was going to wait for Hannah to go first, but since she pointed at the screen, I guess that's my cue. Um, so, you know, there's, it's, it's hard work. So um, when there is people that are able to successfully lead the life and sustain their recovery, it's, there's just, it feels like there's a lot to choose from. Um, 
I have three that stick out in my mind. I won't go into details all, of all of them, but I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are familiar with Vanessa Perkins. I mean, she is just a phenomenal example of a survivor um, and someone who has done the work to be able to sustain her, her journey of healing. Um, she was a graduate of Catch Court in 2012 um, and worked in the prosecutor's office part-time and then was promoted and then was promoted again to Judge Herbert's bailiff um, and just has been a tremendous um, resource and advocate for Catch Court um, and helping the other women that come through the program as kind of like a, a peer support and a mentor. Um, Amber Pascal is a 2016 graduate and she um, is now working for the docket as our um, certified peer support specialist and her journey has just been astounding. So those are two off the top of my head that are just um, really remarkable um, women that um, asked for help and when it was provided to them, they just took every opportunity that they had in front of them to, to change and rebuild their life. Um, and, and it shows because the, the work that they're doing now in the community with other survivors, um, with other community, you know, partners and activists is, is so beneficial and it's astounding. So those are the two that I just want to give a shout out to. And two people like that have to be reasons you come back to work every day. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Hannah, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ken. I, I just will add to that list. And as Gwen said, there are so, so many, but um, I saw Mandy Matthews today and I asked her if I could <laughs> mention her as a success story today. And partially I, I mentioned that because, uh, gosh, what was it? Three or four years ago now, I presented at TEDx Columbus about Catch Court and the work uh, you know, of restorative justice. And I highlighted then um, you know, a fresh graduate of Catch, Mandy, who, um, you know, was, uh, the, the way I described Mandy was that she, she, <laughs> like, sucked the life out of our <laughs> resource. She was like, while I'm here, I'm going to take advantage of everything you throw at me. So, um, she wanted to do every group and take advantage of every opportunity, uh, and she did, um, and she's just been, it's been incredible to watch her particularly, you know, gain custody of her son and bec become sort of that full-time single mom and just really flourish in that role and, you know, purchase, uh, purchase a home. And um, she is, she's now working as a, a case manager at Freedom a la carte. So, you know, she is not only a survivor, but she is really a, a leader and a support for, literally dozens of survivors in in Columbus and so she's just a she's just a phenomenal woman and it's um, an honor to to get to work with her now she's like sort of a colleague you know and that's that's a beautiful thing absolutely and Chris you've uh, you said that you've had an opportunity for some men to who will follow up with the John school and make progress uh coming out of that and really deal with those issues that were that put them out on the street in the first place. Uh, do you have a success story that you could talk to us about? Yeah, so the amazing thing is in the three years or so that we've taught at both the public uh, John School programs in the city attorney's office and also the private John School that we just uh, launched here in Columbus, uh, we've had actually three men who have graduated from that program and have since gone on to become We're br you're breaking up just a little bit chris they went on to become with hearing and speaking so it's pretty amazing because you know i when i talk and uh you know give my presentation about the reason men solicit and when counselors talk you know sometimes sometimes the guys can just you know kind of tune it tune us out but whenever the graduates of the john school get up to speak uh the guys pay attention and there's you know you can't you, <laughs> they're they're listening to every word that they're saying because they realize oh this person has been in my shoes they they got arrested as well they know what that feels like they know what it feels like to sit here um you know through this program and so it's it's really impactful when they speak and they always have guys that come up to, and talk to them afterwards and you know they're able to say you know this is this is your one chance to to try and turn your life around here to think deeply about what you've do, done so you don't do that again 
Thank you. So, Michelle, you're out on with Salvation Army, you're working on the front lines. Hannah is looking to open a drop-in center and be one of those 24-hour places, but uh, Salvation Army is actually operating several of those, and it's a place to be able to reach um, those who are trapped on the street in this lifestyle um, in a way that doesn't include arrest, jail, or any of those things. So what? how, how is Salvation Army involved, and what's that like? Sure. Yeah, so we, as you mentioned, here in, in Central Ohio, we've been engaged in this work um, for about 13 years now, and we credit a, a very strong uh, push in that direction from Ken, actually, who <laughs> has been advocating around this issue for longer than that time, and we really um, we always look back to our first conversations and grateful for the chance to partner from the very beginning and to say, hey, will you do this? <laughs> so, thank you, Ken. Um, so, we... Back uh, when our community was first starting to um, really mobilize around the issue of human trafficking, um, we came to the table with lots of other community partners and we started to talk about what that looked like and what we might do collaboratively. And um, we formed, collectively, we formed the Central Ohio Region Restore Coalition. And um, that group, as we were forming, asked if the Salvation Army would be willing to serve as um, the, the managing the lead organization. So we agreed to that because it's really central to our mission and the work that we do. And so we were really honored to have that opportunity. So part of our role is that we coordinate this uh, really amazing network of partners, uh, like everyone who's on, you know, we're so, so really grateful to have the opportunity to work with all the folks who are here on this. Uh, conversation today, but also um, all together, it's about 116 organizations who are working together here in Central Ohio. Um, and we just believe that our work is more effective collectively and that as we can support each other and uh, kind of make the most of all of our strengths, that we're going to have the greatest impact there. Um, and we, the coalition itself, works around um, legislative advocacy, uh, demand reduction, public awareness. And then a really important part of that work is building a network of services for survivors, um, a collaborative network of services. And um, so we kind of help to organize that effort, but then we also are a kind of provider within that network. So um, on the Salvation Army program side of things, um, we operate the 24-hour human trafficking hotline for Central Ohio for 14 county area. So we, um, we take calls anytime and respond um, in whatever way is necessary in person. Uh, we link directly to shelters and to detox, uh, wrap, um, whatever services basic needs are, um, are, you know, uh, are in need at that time, wrap those services on survivors. And then depending on their, um, their desires and the best fit for them, uh, link into ongoing comprehensive case management. And um, we are one of those providers as well. So we do serve survivors um, really of sex and labor trafficking and from all different kinds of backgrounds uh, in comprehensive case management. And really the goal there is to just help support, uh, be a place to support them in figuring out where they would like to go next and helping to open all of those doors to get there. And that's where that collective network comes in because not, there isn't any of us who provides all of the services needed. And so it's really, um, it's really great to be able to open doors because we already have a relationship with a provider of that service and to kind of streamline and make that go more easily. Um, so we, in addition to the hotline, the emergency response to case management, as you mentioned, we do operate um, drop-in program hours both on uh, the west side of Columbus and on the near east side of Columbus. Um, we uh, support also our law enforcement partners. Uh, we provide, we staff victim advocacy for um, the Central Ohio Human Trafficking Task Force, and then also partner with PACT to be on site for uh, operations and to be that kind of first um, conversation, you know, around the needs and to try to uh, engage and lead uh, victims in that situation into services and into this larger network. Um, we, a couple other things I'm looking at my list, I always miss a few things when I'm talking. Um, we also conduct um, trauma and uh, substance groups in uh, here in Columbus area in, in the Franklin County Jail and also in Delaware County Jail with incarcerated survivors. Um, and when it is not um, a pandemic, which I'm hoping is wrapping up soon, uh, we conduct street outreach three times a week uh, and, and then engage directly, um, kind of going 
right there where folks are on the street um, and conducting outreach as well. Uh, so I'm hoping vaccinations are on the, on the move. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that's coming our way again very soon and that we will be back out as an organization with that work as well. So I'd like to throw out, um, for those of you who have worked with women who have come through arrest, through the courts, um, what do you find to be the most effective way to work with them or to reach them? What, what draws them in? I, I think, um, every, so it's different for everyone, so not to generalize any one person's experience, sure. but I think um, non a, a non-judgmental, really genuine relationship approach is probably the most important thing. So I do think it's great to have all of the resources, but oftentimes in that point of crisis, someone may not even know exactly what they need and they really may not be able to wrap their head around what you're talking about, but that relationship I think makes the connection. And I think that, that, that that's one of the most important things and to just recognize um, they may be going through a criminal justice process, but to recognize that everyone here is, is here to help and that we are here to help because we understand that, um, you know, that they've been victimized by a crime. And <laughs> okay, uh, Hannah, Gwen, anything you'd add to that? I think uh, I would just add to that the fact that Columbus, because we've been doing such good work for such a long time now, that there is this incredible survivor leader community, and as much as possible, when uh, women who are just getting off the street or just being arrested or just going through the court system, when they're able to interact with somebody who's been in their shoes, um, a peer support or whatever the title is, I, I just think all of our organizations at this point should be hiring these women because they really are the best um, first contact for, for women who are exiting. And that's been one of the things that really impressed me the times I've been able to observe Catch Court is the women who have completed the program who come back and who are just reaching in trying to pull more people out. Um, so yeah, Gwen, anything you'd add? I just think that the, um, it's kind of like a melding of Hannah and Michelle's thoughts is the, the community element that's provided specifically through Catch Court and kind of the you know, survivor community that's at, at Freedom a la carte and things like that, I think is so imperative um, to kind of help erase that stigma that they feel in every aspect of their life, except in that community, because everybody's in that same journey and walk of life. Um, there's just so much power in that. Um, so I think that has been extremely effective in just getting them on, on the journey of healing because they, they feel like they're human. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Chris, you work with the men. Is there, um, what would you say is the most effective or are there several components that, that uh, establish an effective outreach to men in this arena? Yeah, so like Hannah and Gwen mentioned, I think it, it does start with that relationship. I mean, the three guys that have become volunteers with us, it started with just, um, you know, me going out to, to coffee with them. But before the pandemic hit us back, when that, we were able to do that. Um, just, yeah, having that relationship and conversation with them and to help them realize that, you know, we're not here to just judge them or condemn them, but to actually help them, help, have them, you know, let them get help. And then the next thing I would say is uh, giving them something to do, pointing them to resources. So, you know, we have a um, kind of a cheat sheet of licensed professional counselors that we've worked with who specialize in everything from sex addiction to anxiety, depression, etc. And if there's a specific area that these men, um, you know, want additional help with, then they've, they've, we've connected them to, to professional counselors in, in the area to get additional help. So, um, so that relationship, resources, and then giving them something to do. You know, a lot of these guys, um, you know, uh, not a lot of them, the few that have come to us you know, have, have said that they feel horrible for what they've done and they want to give back some way. So you're breaking up just to hear. And I was, that, you know, kind of on the flip side of this, um, you know, we're 
we at GSNA were really advocating for tougher penalties because it's, you know, it's great what we're doing to point these mental resources, but we need to do a better job at preventing them from doing this in the first place, right? And so, you know, all the work that Deputy United is doing and all the work that, you know, that our legislative advocates are doing, you know, pushing for bills and uh, policies that will increase the penalties, a whole other aspect that we need to do a better job. At. I mean, cost more a parking ticket or a speeding ticket, right, than, than solicitation for these men. So we need to increase the fines. We need to extend the sentences. We need to, you know, make John school more than just six hours. For some cities that do multiple months of John school, you know, we need to penalties. Okay. We're uh, we're cutting out a little bit, Chris. I, I appreciate that. So, Deputy Chief Knight, in addition to a uh, that you sometimes wear a visible construction hat, um, what are you developing for us in, in the days ahead uh, that that people can anticipate in terms of how the police department will be looking at this? Uh, thanks, Ken. So we have a comprehensive plan and approach to this that includes all our partnerships um, and everybody here, but it extends far beyond that as well. But a comprehensive plan to the problem is the only way to address this. And so we're looking at demand um, specifically right now. Um, as Chris mentioned, we are um, we have drafted legislation to take the city council in February to um, do something that has not been done, as far as I know, in the state of Ohio, which is separate supply and demand in the code. And then we treat um, the demand side of the equation under the code as sexual exploitation. And we call it what it is. And um, we're establishing real consequences. So right now the average fine is $70. People are and no jail time for... Um, someone who solicits a prostitute and, and the community is offended by that. And I think we should all be offended by that because, you know, our code actually says a lot about what we find important as a community. So, you know, we're going to establish mandatory minimums um, it, for repeat offenders, which aren't currently dealt with in that um, there's going to be real fines starting at $300. We um, will have jail time real jail time and minimum jail time for repeat offenders. So the first time somebody gets caught, um, we want to provide them services and, and, and opportunities to understand and be educated and um, things like you know therapy led uh, treatment. But we want, to, want them to know that if they re-offend, there's going to be severe consequences. This is a, a you know, solicitation of prostitution, sexual exploitation is something that hides in the shadows. And until we as a community are willing to not provide that cover for those individuals, then um, we're not gonna be able to really resolve that issue. So what we wanna do is make sure that we're identifying what the offender's needs are uh, on the demand side with legislation to change the code and building in minimums and, and things that address repeat offenders and uh, ensuring that we're putting assessment tools in place. And we're working on that right now to put assessment tools in place so the judges will be able to know what the offender needs when they go to court. Um, there's gonna be alternatives for treatment for underlying root causes for their behavior and actively seeking, we are actively seeking to create an enforcement environment that is hostile to individuals who want to go here and prey upon um, what we consider victims. And um, I, I say it all the time, I'd like to say it again, uh, we wanna create an environment where Columbus is not the place you come to buy sex. And so we're doing a variety of things to, uh, on that demand side of the equation in, right now. So in February, we're hoping to put that in front of the public and city council. We've got a tremendous amount of support from everyone. And we want to make sure that we're providing opportunities for these offenders to get out of uh, this environment as well and, and never return. But um, we want real consequences to that behavior. All right. I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this panel discussion. Um, 
We're hoping to maybe create some more and continue the education process for people in our community and to let them know about uh, not only what the Division of Police is doing, but also what our community partners are doing. So thank you for the role that all of you play. Um, and, and we look forward to a uh, continued relationship with each of you and your organizations. Um, and we will uh, thank everyone who showed up to watch this and we hope it gets, uh, gets a, a strong discussion going in our community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank, thank you. Everyone.